Thank you everyone for joining today's TRM webinar. Today we'll be talking about compatible unit estimating, CUE, with Maximo. The upcoming hour is jam-packed and might go a bit long with our Q&A session at the end, so I'll keep this introduction short. Many of you are familiar with TRM. We are one of the leading Maximo business partners and one of our industry specialties is the energy and utility sector. This has led to special expertise in the water and wastewater industries, development of a couple of safety clearance applications, and multiple Maximo engagements for customers in this sector. We also recognize the importance of compatible unit estimating, and some of our consultants have become experts here. This leads me to introducing our presenter, Ryan Adams, one of TRM's senior Maximo consultants. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn over to you, Ryan. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Adams. Um, I've been working with compatible units in Maximo for a couple of years now. Um, and um, it's a pretty complicated application. I'm sure a lot of you are here curious about how it works, uh, what it actually does. I saw a lot of names on the list from the uh, Maximo user group, uh, or the uh, utilities user group. Um, some of the people we spoke to uh, a couple months ago that were interested in getting into the application. So. I'm sure a lot of you have questions about how to get started with compatible units. So really that's what I'm going to try and lean this session around rather than how the application it works itself. Maybe more a little bit of business process as to how to get jumping into your first uh, development of your compatible units. So this instance here is a Maximo instance with, um, you can see that I have Maximo Free Utilities on it as well as a couple other verticals. But we're going to be spending our time today in Maximo for Utilities. When you install Maximo for utilities, you're going to get a new application inside of the or administration module called the organization's T&D application. This application functions pretty similarly to your standard organization's application. The only difference is that you're going to be getting new options in your select action menu, which are going to function specifically for your transmission and distribution options. So inside the select action menu here now, you can see that there is the T&D options portion which isn't going to exist in the standard organization's application. So in here, these are the options which control your compatible units and your transmission and just distribution implementation. You need to start here. Um, you can't start with compatible units without first considering your account codes and asset codes and how you want to set up for capitalization. So what I've done in here today is kind of set up some different account code and asset code options. And then I want to go through how those roll into compatible unit library records and then how those roll into capitalization on the way out at the end. So let's talk about some of the account code options I've set up in here. They're really very basic. They just have an accounting code and then separation by plant account. So you can see that each one is unique. Now, both accounting code and plant account. I've not put in GL account values for these, though you can and you can force those GL accounts to push to work orders. At this time, just for the demonstration of how this works, I'm leaving the GL accounts out. Secondary to accounting codes are the asset codes. So you have an account code, and then you have an asset code, which is the next level down. So you can have multiple asset codes assigned to the same accounting code, as I've done here. AAAX and AAA are both assigned to accounting code AAA. Same with Bs and Cs and Ds. So it's just how the levels break down with your accounting. So separating these out here is fairly simple. How they get onto your CU library is really the difficult portion of the, the, the data design in here. So. Some other things you need to get through before you even look at data design, you need to select which crafts are applicable for use in CUs, in this case the checkbox here. We'll take care of that. You need to decide which items are applicable for CUs. And for that to work, you need to have both values, CUE unit cost greater than one, and issue unit needs to be populated. Otherwise, these values will not show up in the CUE application for selection in the materials list. Tools. 
is again the same. There's a checkbox. You check the box and it will grab the tool from the tool application, making it applicable for the CU library. Services works the same as items. The unit price and order unit both need to be populated. While I'm here talking about this, some options we've done for some clients in the past that are looking for automatic ways to make sure that all of the items get in here is writing an automation script which grabs from the inventory cost table and populates this data back to the, this item value here. Other options include showing the value on the item master screen and allowing the users to populate it themselves. Um, there are various ways to do it which won't require users to come in here and populate this. But you can see that this issue unit does come directly from the item.issue unit. However, the CUE unit cost is its own value item.plus DCUE units cost, which does not exist on the item table, but can be at, or on the item application, um, but can be added to the screen. Configuring workgroups is asking the application which workgroups may be creating records inside of the CUE application. It's really just there for separation. Um, I've only selected maintenance and engineering uh, out of the Bedford um, site. This is just your standard Maximo data, but you can see that most of these groups wouldn't be bothering with compatible units estimating anyways. Safety team might. After that, there are several other options in here, um, most of which I didn't spend any time changing. They're just set to the standard default functions. Um, version control being one of them, labor factors. You've also got how your estimates push, whether or not you want to have a default travel factor applied to all of your CUs. This will multiply all costs of work against a uh, set value. Any acceptance options. So again, when you're pushing from your estimate to your work order, how do you want it to manage these things? And then you've got your labor adders, loading types, which is your overheads. Work type, which may be different work types, can be set inside of the CUE application for separation, mostly on what type of work CU creates. And then you've got your work zone factors, which may be a travel factor that's associated to the work depending on how far you're driving for different types of jobs. So for one job, you may have a travel factor of 10% saying that any labor charge into that job, 10% of that time automatically gets charged back to travel. So all of this setup occurs before you do any of your data inside of the CU library. After that's done, you can start considering how you actually set up your compatible units. Now I've set up some very basic stuff in here and I'll start with my lowest level and why I set up what I did at the lowest level. In here I've got separation based on various things. This is a CU which handles only a freight cost. And you can see that it's a quantity of one with a unit cost of one. Because the difference of freight can be so, so much, this gives the engineer the ability to actually change the cost of freight during the estimate based on what they assume the cost of freight to be. And you can use comparisons from past jobs or even official quotes for that data. Rather than a service here, I've got a single individual labor line for an hour. Again, another very plain CU, which is just referencing a labor record for a certain number of hours. We need an electrician for one hour for this CU. Notice that I'm not populating account code or asset code for this level. Overhead line maintenance, again, the same. We've got one hour of time posted against overhead line maintenance. And these are all the same, either services or labor rates at the lowest level. Another thing you can keep at the lowest level is individual level zero uh, CEUs for material. Um, if you're an organization who tracks each material specifically as an asset, 
then you do want to keep individual labor lines at this level. And uh, maybe I'll even show that right now. So we'll, we'll create a CU here, a very basic one. And we'll call it um, level zero. And I'm going to give this one an accounting code and an asset code. What I'm saying to, whoops, to this CU then essentially is when I add this CU to a record, I intend for it to create a capitalized asset against your reporting for um, with whatever organization you report for, for what assets you are counting inside of your FERC accounting. So um, I don't see anything in here that really qualifies, but we'll do this anyways. Quantity one. and make it active. So I created a very basic material level CU here. Talk about our next level up before I start building estimates. <clears throat> CU level one. In CU level one here, I've created several material packages that will respond differently depending upon the way I've filled out their accounting codes. Here you can see material package one has several materials against it, but no accounting code. There are no services, tools, or child secrets. Material package two is set up the same way. Material package three does have its own accounting code and asset code, as well as a list of materials. What you are telling the application when you define this asset code is what we are creating here at Material Package 3 is one single capitalized asset. So all of these materials clumped together create one asset because of the asset code here. If your intent was separation was that this material line here is its own asset and maybe this material line here is its own asset, then you would want to create lower levels of CUs, apply your asset codes to that level, and then reference them as child CUs here. So I've demonstrated that with the next level of CUs, which is three, here, where I've got package 1AX, where I've actually put an accounting code against this. So what I'm saying is that this is now one So what we have here is different groups of CUs using all of the children's CUs that I created. And you can level them in different ways. In this one, I've got child CUs with material pack one and MEC. Material pack one being just a group of materials and MEC being a single labor line, which we requested one hour of. So I'm requesting quantity of 18 in reference for 18 hours of work. The other option here would have been instead of using this MEC line, you could have put the labor line directly against here. That's really preference on how you control your data and how you want to manage it. So um, personally, I don't, I don't see any difference between the two unless you wanted to separate capitalization for some reason based against the uh, hourly rate. And then I've added a service here. So you can have child CUs against parent CU and then still add regular lines to it, a single labor line, a single service line, a single material line, et cetera, single tool line. So here we have our list of CUs. Very basic group, nothing um, extravagant here. But they're working very well in the estimating application. So we'll move them all over. I've got a very ba basic estimate here with several packages that I've created. 
we'll go over what it is. So one version. I've not made any changes to filters. I'm not even going to go through filters today. Um, this is pretty complicated. And definitely take an hour about to talk about filter adders and how they all work. I've not put anything about against contracts, but you can see that the estimate did estimate and there are costs against it. Applications one and two. And then I've got package 1A and package 1A plus snow removal. Now the way I've set my data up, I already know exactly where all my capitalization is going to go on these two because I've put everything against asset code AAAAA. And just to display that, I'll open up each one of these CUs. And show you that they're both against accounting code and asset code AAAA. Now because of the way I've set these up, I also know that each one of these two CUs is going to create its own asset. Rather than each material line underneath it creating a counted asset, you're only going to get two assets out of this estimate. So to prove that, you run the report. You don't know if your data is working perfectly until you have the report for comparison, honestly. So we're going to run the report against this one. And here it is. And you can see that against plan account AAAA and addition unit AAAA, there was quantity one and quantity one against the other additional unit. Now these are separated because they came from two different stations, station one and station two. Even though that's not referenced here on the report, that is where the separation is coming from. You can see the total additions here is referenced 2,668. Which is correct against the total costs here on the estimate. Venetius, if you're listening, this is the first time I've seen this work since 76 got implemented. It looks good. <laughs> um, the report wasn't working for a couple uh, of iterations, but it's working today, so it's, this is good. Um, let's see. So again, another report with basic design. Now I'm looking at package 1 D and E as well as package 5 S. Package 1 D and E, we made the separation here at map pack 3 and 4, but they're hours of mechanical and electrical. So what I actually expect to see here is that these hours are going to get rolled in and separated, and divided against the difference of cost here evenly. Package 5F here, though, has its own accounting and asset code. So I expect all of this to get rolled up. And even though it has its own accounting and asset code here, I expect it to get rolled up into the F account code because the higher level trumps whatever's below. So this one is also version estimated. Okay, <clears throat> so here's this one now. You can see that D and E have exact unit costs that match. The reason for that is that I duplicated the CUs to create the difference between the two. All I did was change the asset codes between them. So the cost being exactly the same is what we expect. But you can see that the F value here actually got separated out.
Because if you don't get this right, either A, you're not billing your customers enough, or B, you're billing your customers too much and you're going to be audited. So compatible units itself is a fairly simple application when it comes to data design. But the asset code and account code design that come in before the data is probably the most complex part of implementation. You probably want to spend a good two, three weeks thinking about how you want your asset codes before you even consider loading your first round of data. After this is done here, you've got an estimate. You can take the estimate now and push it to a work order. And I've pushed all of these, or I've, ex I've estimated all of these, though I've not accepted any of, these, any of this work. When the work is accepted, this button here, you tell it which version you want to push. And it takes all of the data that from your packages and pushes them to the plans tab of your work order. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see that I now have mechanical labor with 36 hours and the proper rate. All of the materials requested from the various CUs, and there were no services and tools. You may see a difference of costs here in your view cost table compared to your estimate, because your view cost is going to come from a different location than your estimate. Estimate costs are going to come from the item cost that's entered in that value that I showed you guys earlier, the item dot plus DCUE unit cost. View costs comes from your actual storeroom cost value. So it's referencing uh, the last purchase price. Um, or the average cost, depending upon how you reference that specific item. So you may see a difference of costs here, 2,179. If I return back to the estimate, you can see that the total cost on the estimate is actually 2,368. I know where that difference is coming from, though. See these labor hours off-site? Nine. Those aren't anything we added to our estimate. Those came directly from the organization's table. When we had that default labor factor, that's where this value came from. All labor hours requested against any job are automatically multiplied by 25%, and that 25% is added on top of the job for travel time, straight out of the organization's application. So currently, the way our CUEs are set up and the work order in the planning phase. If you accept an estimate and you decide that you don't like it, you've gotten into the work order, you've seen that you put too many hours on it, maybe you want to modify that, you can do that directly here from the work order. It will not change your estimate. Or we can go back to the estimate. The work order has not been approved yet, so you can actually still make changes. One of the strongest points inside of this application is that I can actually take the version that we've already accepted to the work order. I can duplicate that version, and now I have a brand new version of my estimate. I can go back to the station and say perhaps we requested not enough package A in this case. You can make a change to the version here, re-estimate it. So when I come back to the versions here, I can actually compare costs directly against the two different versions. You can see that version two is slightly more expensive than version one. We requested another CU twice. You, this is really what estimating is for. If you were to use multiple contractors, um, various vendors, 
Uh, you were debating between whether or not you wanted to make an installation during a cold season or your summer seasons. You're debating whether you want to install a pole coastally or into rock. Um, the amount of cost, depending on the types of materials, depending on which type of job you're doing, may vary. So because each CU might vary depending on the type of job, you are able to then come in and compare these costs depending upon how you set up your job. So the way I always explain it is that the CU application is meant for deciding if you're going to install 100 lines of power pole, do you go around the mountain or through the mountain? Is it cheaper to build your poles a longer distance and go over the top of the mountain with a bunch of different poles in the same amount of line? Or is it cheaper to hire a drill and drill through the mountain, put everything in conduit, and then use a much smaller amount of cable? Uh, and those are the types of comparisons you're making here in this application. So now that I've made a change to my estimate, I can actually accept this estimate directly back to the work order. Because the work order is still in a, in a status that allows me to change it based on your work order options, this has nothing to do with uh, what status the work order is in. Whopper is where it allows you to move plans out of the box. Um, so you pretty much want to stick with Whopper. If you were to move things that are currently have build hours against them, there are other functions inside of estimating for modifying estimates that are currently in pro against in progress work. Um, I won't show any of that today, but that functionality has been added. So you can see that we've actually got a new set of effort hours here against the mechanical rate. Originally, there was a lot less hours against this job. That's pretty basic CU estimating at its core. You want to look at your asset code, account codes. At, at the lowest level, figure out how your data builds in for your CU libraries, what you've decided on for what level should be the important things you're tracking as capitalized items. You build your data for the CU library that way. Test it in an estimate, verify it against the report, and then once you're positive that your accounting data is rolling up in the correct manner, build the rest of your data. And that's your basic implementation steps to getting started with CU estimate. That's great, Ryan. Are you ready to go to questions? Yeah, I think I think this is a good time. Okay, cool. Uh, before we do that, I had a couple of people text in and saying they are looking for the recording of this, and we will make that available to you shortly after the presentation in a link in an email. It's also on our webinar archive page, and we'll make it available on our YouTube page. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and look for questions in the audience. So I'm looking for a hands up on your webinar panel. If I see a hands up, I'll open up your line and call on you. So bear with me, Ryan, while I scroll through our audience. Yes, sir. So Michelle, I see that your hand is up, so I'm going to go ahead and open up your line. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, um, so we, we have a couple of business people in the room, and they actually have questions. So. so when you performed acceptance on the second version, did that update, or did it override the entire uh, version one? It overrides the, the data on the work order that came from version one. So any reference to CU data will be removed and overwritten. Thank you. So that's what the in-progress version is for. There's another type of estimate in here. I'll just point at it just to show you where it is. If I were to create another version here, you've got the estimate type here. There's an estimate type for in-progress. What you're saying when you tell it of estimate type of in-progress is that I intend for you not to modify what I already have against the plans tab. Anything additional that goes on this CU at this point is additional materials or data to be added to the to what's already there.
Is that additional 7.6 functionality or is that in 7.5? This is additional 7.6 functionality. It was just re very recently added to the T&D application. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and look for additional hands up. Again, that's just a feature on your webinar panel. And I'll unmute you if you have a question. Bear with me, Ryan. I'm scrolling through our audience. I don't see any other hands up. So again, we'll be sending out the link and we'll ask, be asking you for what you'd like to see on the next TRM webinar. And also, Ryan, I just want to say that uh, someone texted in that after their conversation with you at the mug, you solved their problem, which is excellent. Uh, well, so I'll hear. let everyone. Yeah, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to let everyone go for today. Um, we hope to see you on the next webinar, and th thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye.